Speaker, good to see you. A lot to get to. Let's start with the federal stimulus. The governor will veto this package of bills. So what is your next move? Yeah, it's unfortunate if he decides to do that because we have a really good plan. Uh, we've gone through a thorough vetting process. We had public hearings. Uh, we have a balanced package that focuses on aid to homeowners, aid to folks who own a small business or in the tourist industry, which has been the hardest hit. It also makes sure that we invest in things like broadband. So there's really no good reason why he would veto it other than playing politics. And I think that when the framers put together the Constitution, they never intended for one person to be able to make all the choices in state government. It requires compromise and working together, which is exactly what our plan is. So I know he said he is leaning toward veto it, but I guess I'm an optimist. I think that there's no good reason he should, and hopefully he won't. Uh, are you considering legal action? We have to, but that would be a last choice, not a first resort. I mean, let's just look at it this way that, you know, there's no local government in the state that would say the mayor just gets to decide how to spend all the money or the school board administrator or whatever it is. So it should be a bedrock of our constitutional republic that we have branches of government that each play a role, that no one should get to be dictator over the other. And that's what I hope we ultimately have out of this. So you know, we saw the Supreme Court decided in our favor in multiple cases over the course of the past year, where we see that Governor Evers overreached uh, on different topics. This could be another one of those, but again, it'd just be so much easier if Governor Evers would work with us to have a good plan put together, because I'm sure most people know his plan is nothing more than a press release at this point. There's no detail. Ours is actually legislation that's been voted on with the detail that could help the state immediately, not a plan that might come someday somehow. Democrats have questions the, the motives of this, saying, look, at the CARES Act, this is the way it was. According to the federal law, the governor has the power to do this. They looked to the Fiscal Bureau analysis that said some of the provisions, including the tax cuts, may, may not even be within the law of this bill. And, and you may even have to pay some of that money back. Well, we wouldn't be paying it back to anybody but the citizens in Wisconsin, first of all. And I don't believe that. Um, I think that the very idea that the federal government gets to decide how we use state resources is preposterous. Uh, and especially in the situation where you have one elected official, the governor, signing uh, an acceptance of money with no ability to work with the legislature, who is a co-equal branch of government. So the founders never said that the governor gets to decide and kind of sit, put a situation together where he unilaterally makes choices. That's not the way that our constitutional republic is founded. So, you know, if we had to go through that process, it would be certainly unfortunate. But, you know, don't forget, the governor has said he has to get this money out the door quickly because it's a pandemic. Well, here we are six weeks later, and they have four years to spend the money, which, of course, four years to spend the money is preposterous if it's an emergency. And Governor Evers still has no idea, other than a, a vague press release, where the money's going to go. We have a specific plan with specific ideas that could become law tomorrow if he would stop playing politics. There's a number, another of uh, uh, other COVID and vaccine-related bills working its way through the legislature right now. One uh, centered around what's become known as vaccine passports that we've talked about a lot lately. Do you support this notion of, of banning private businesses from being able to require proof of vaccination if they want? Well, I certainly don't support mandatory vaccinations. Um, you know, we led an effort, unfortunately, it was vetoed by Governor Evers again to say that we want vaccines to be widespread. I intend to take one myself. Uh, so I certainly am not anti-vaccine in any way whatsoever, but I certainly strongly believe that people have a right to make those choices themselves and not have it dictated by someone else. So do I think that you should have to have a vaccine to work at a factory or a fast food restaurant? I don't. Uh, do I think that you should have to have a vaccine passport to be able to patronize a business? I don't. There's no science. There's no data that says that it will do anything more than hurt our economic recovery. So, yes, I support that idea. I think it shouldn't be necessary because we should respect people's private wishes. But if it becomes that way, of course, we're going to have to do something about it. Do you think that bill that would prohibit uh, that requirement, do you think that'll pass your, your caucus? Is there enough support in it? I feel it will. We have not had a discussion about it specifically in our caucus, but I think the very idea uh, is one that most people focus on, the individual choices that people make and the personal responsibility that we expect from some, but you can't mandate that idea uh, on everybody. We want to get toward herd immunity. I think, as I've said before, Governor Evers has done some things well during this pandemic, and the rollout of vaccines, of course, was very troubled in the beginning, but now we're a leader in the country. That's a good thing. So the more vaccines that are out there means the fewer folks should be afraid. They should be able to go to a business. They should be able to go to work, uh, go to school especially, and not have this fear factor um, as something that's holding them back. There's been a lot of attention around legislation surrounding the election, not only here in Wisconsin, but in, in other states across the country. Here in Wisconsin, a dozen plus bills introduced dealing with everything from regulating drop boxes to more absentee ballot paperwork to limiting who can consider themselves indefinitely confined. 
any legislation out there at this point that you don't support? Uh, not that I've seen introduced at this point. I mean, just the very idea of indefinitely confined, when we passed that as part of our voter ID, we wanted to make sure that everybody had a right to vote and that we had no unnecessary roadblocks in the way. So when we put a proposal together, indefinitely confined meant somebody who's in a nursing home or it meant somebody who didn't have um, access to a way to get to vote. Uh, well, here we are where we see people out and about on Facebook saying they're indefinitely confined. Well, that is clearly not accurate. It's a lie. People are breaking the law, in my opinion. So we're trying to make sure that we have something that is significantly more uh, prescriptive so people know exactly what it is to be indefinitely confined and they don't break the law or try to circumvent the voter ID requirements. And critics out uh, there. We also as ahead, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say, critics out there, including a large number of corporations in recent days, have been speaking out against legislation, not only in places like Georgia, but Wisconsin and other states. They say this is simply voter suppression. Well, they're wrong. You know, corporate America does many good things, but they are not engaged in the idea of how laws are made. I mean, they're engaged in selling a product or trying to appeal to a group of consumers, which I think is the virtue signaling that some of these corporations are doing. The idea of having a photo ID requirement is something that is broadly supported by the public. A photo ID requirement is required by many of these corporations to access their production facilities or to be able to deal with one of their vendors. So it's not something different than the most important thing our society has, which is the ability to legally cast a ballot. So, you know, I respect their position, um, but we are lucky that we have good corporate citizens in Wisconsin. We haven't seen that same kind of blowback because we have had a very reasonable approach to our elections to make sure that they are free, fair, and that no one doubts the outcome once the election is already concluded. Uh, on the flip side of that, former Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark wrote this past week that you and the Senate Majority Leader, quote, looked at strengthening gun rights and voting integrity like it's the plague, something to be avoided at all costs. Well, David Clark's wrong, too. <laughs> so I guess it's one of those situations where people on the far left and people on the far right uh, each go toward their extremes. And it's really sad because David Clark has done a lot of good things, and he is right. We have to be bold in making sure that we protect the right to vote, and we're doing that. Uh, and that's why our proposals will come forward. I feel very confident that we are having a good, robust discussion, uh, and we have great proposals that are going to come forward in Wisconsin. So I understand that sometimes people don't understand the way that the lawmaking process works. It's slow and steady, but we almost always get it right in the end. And this is a prime example. We've had hearings. We've passed legislation. Uh, I have no doubt that we will have a good, comprehensive package to send to the governor. But the pressure really should be on Governor Evers to make sure that he listens to the public and wants to have those free and fair elections that all of us assume are part of our democracy, as opposed to trying to put pressure on folks who are doing the right thing already. Uh, another bill out there that's received some attention here in Wisconsin would ban transgender athletes from participating in girls' sports from kindergarten through college. Do you, do you support this bill? Oh, of course I do. I mean, the very idea that you are going to have people uh, who are physically uh, a different sex competing in sports really hurts the idea of having uh, female athletics be premier across our country. We have got fantastic folks, and we had a press conference where we brought in some female Olympians who um, really talked about the idea that if you allowed men to compete in women's sports, uh, no matter what clothes they wear in the dressing room or wherever they are, uh, they certainly would have an advantage over the female athletes, and that's not right. So I, we're going to have a hearing on it. We're going to move that legislation forward. Uh, I think it's something, again, that's broadly supported by the public, that we want to ensure that folks have a right to compete, but they don't have an unfair advantage uh, just because of a choice they're making. The NCAA came out this past week and said it could pull championships out of states that would enact such a law. They have the right to do uh, what they want, but that doesn't mean that we should allow uh, organizations like that to dictate what public policy should be. We have to stand up for the athletes. We have to stand up for the female athletes, especially who want to have a chance to compete and not go along with a political agenda, again, that isn't focused on the facts or the science, but instead is focused on what the public perception is and trying to curry favor with those citizens. When you look at that bill or you look at a number of the election bills, the governor will likely veto all of this. Is this setting the stage for campaign issues in, in 2022 in, in a promise essentially that this will be enacted if a Republican is elected governor? Well, on the election reform, certainly I think that's an issue where the public is going to see a clear difference between one group of people who wants to make sure that everybody has a chance to vote, but that when the election results are counted, we have absolute faith that the person who won the election did so fair and square. Uh, it seems like the other side is nowhere near as worried about that. They would rather kind of throw the rules out the door and just say, well, however it works out, uh, as long as it fulfills our political agenda, that's good for them. I, I think there are going to be contrasts. 
Um, so we are passing policies not because of politics or campaigns. We're passing policies because we believe in these things. We think they're the best interests of the state of Wisconsin and the citizens of the state, especially those that we represent. So I, I want to ensure that we have a good, robust discussion. Uh, and if you'll notice, Governor Evers really has been absent for most of these conversations. He puts out an occasional press release, uh, but really has been very disengaged, mostly focusing on his core constituency in Madison and Milwaukee. And I think many of us know that Madison and Milwaukee are an important part of the state, but they don't get to dictate every single public policy unless, of course, you're Governor Evers. Jill Underly was elected the next state superintendent. Uh, are you concerned with the number of races that, that Democrats, statewide races that Democrats have run won recently? Oh, no. I mean, uh, they have had a string of wins. Uh, they had 2016 uh, where they lost. Uh, they had 2018, part of a blowback against President Trump, and of course 2020, where it was razor thin. So the fact that they are able to raise tens of millions of dollars from special interest donors outside the state to flood, you know, lies and, um, and misconceptions about what's happening in Wisconsin, I guess that's their advantage right now. That's how Jill Underly won. She was outspending the conservative candidate five, six, seven to one because of special interest money. Well, at the end of the day, we know that Jill Underly and her allies are beholden to the teachers union. They are not going to worry about what parents think or the voters. They're going to worry about the taxpayers who are funding their campaign uh, through the teachers union. Uh, that's the ones that they're worrying about. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of a sad commentary. But then again, I believe in the First Amendment, people have a right to do it, uh, but they don't get to take credit because of the policies that they're enacting. All that they get to do is take credit for the success at raising huge amounts of resources from special interests to spread lies about Republicans. And to that, the morning after she won, you tweeted, count me as someone who isn't going to support putting another nickel into this unaccountable state bureaucracy. Just unpack that for me for a second. Are you against additional funding to DPI because she won? Uh, no, it's because of the agenda um, that it seems like DPI is fostering. It's not about trying to find the best results for schools. I mean, the very fact that uh, Superintendent Underly said that she didn't even know when students should be back for school, she hoped for the fall, that is something that parents want now. They want their kids back in school. We have seen a lot of kids, especially those of color, lose almost an entire year of schooling. And if we care about the achievement gap in the state, Putting more money into DPI, which seems like it's the same old, same old with no real successes to point to, I would rather put that money in school districts and in uh, kids all around the state, not into a Madison bureaucracy really beholden to the teacher union. The Senate Majority Leader said this past week there isn't enough support with, among Senate Republicans to pass recreational or medical marijuana. Wondering where your caucus is with, with both of those at this point. Yeah, we certainly don't support recreational marijuana. That's been a non-starter uh, in many ways uh, for a long time. But I have been consistent. I was one of the ones that came out in the very beginning saying I am open to figuring out a way to get medicinal marijuana done. I told Governor Evers last year when he proposed recreational marijuana that that is going to make getting medicinal marijuana significantly harder. Again, he ignored our advice. He came out now wanting to legalize full recreational marijuana like Illinois or one of the states around us. That's the wrong answer. We have enough drugs already in the state of Wisconsin. We certainly don't need to make it worse by making, uh, you know, recreational marijuana the law of Wisconsin. But I do think we should be able to find a way to get medicinal marijuana done if we were willing to work toward that goal. But again, he is so married to kind of that downtown Madison, Dane County liberal agenda that he couldn't even say, let's just work together on medicinal. It had to be everything or nothing. And it sounds like, according to the Senate, that's unfortunately going to be nothing. Is there enough support among Assembly, Assembly Republicans at this point for medical? Um, I don't want to comment on that because we, you know, we haven't had a discussion with every single member, but I think there is substantial support uh, for medicinal marijuana if it's done properly. I don't want it to be on every single street corner like they've done in other states, but if you did it in a much more restrictive way so that somebody who had an actual medical condition had an idea of what they needed for their treatment, that is significantly different than just letting people self-medicate. Uh, which unfortunately is what's happened in other states. Before you go, I want to get you on Foxconn real quick. You're now part of the WEDC Board of Directors. I know that negotiations are underway between the state and the company for a new contract. Here's what details you can provide about where those negotiations are and when a final new agreement may be in place. Well, it's unfortunate that the Ebers administration is really breaking the goals that we set with Foxconn, was, which was they would not get a single nickel of taxpayer dollars until they produce the results, which are clearly measurable. Anybody who drives by Foxconn sees huge buildings that are going up. There are already almost a thousand people working on the site. They're the largest taxpayer already in Racine County uh, for property taxes. So they are meeting all the goals that we have set. 
But again, Governor Evers is playing politics with this. So unfortunately, it sounds like they're going to have a different agreement. Uh, they're negotiating that right now. So Fox kind of making concessions um, because they are having their back up against the wall, even though they are meeting the goals that were set uh, by the last administration and by the legislation we enacted. Uh, the, go the governor doesn't seem to want to keep the state's deal, which is why he'll come forward with a new proposal. It'll hopefully keep Foxconn here and let them grow and give them some certainty so they don't have to still say that they are playing politics um, with Governor Evers as he is forcing them uh, to do things that are outside the scope of what the original, original agreement was. Is there a chance the company will completely pull out? Oh, I have no idea, but I think that's incredibly unlikely. If you drive by, they've already made millions and millions and millions of dollars of investment. So, you know, based on the word of the state, uh, they did all those things. And now if Governor Evers wants to renege on the deal that was cut, um, I guess Foxconn has to make decisions to say whether or not the new deal is still worthy of staying. I hope it will be. I think we're a great place to have a business still, even with Governor Evers. I think we have a great workforce and they've been able to really showcase some of the best and brightest around Wisconsin and the things that they can offer. So I'm optimistic about our future. I just think it's sad that when a company cuts a deal with any entity like the state, that a new elected official comes in and tries to change it, uh, that didn't seem right to me. Finally, I know I've exceeded my time, but when you look to 2022, what do Wisconsin Republicans need to do to win back the governor's mansion and keep the U.S. Senate seat? Well, I think we need to showcase uh, the good things that we have been for. Wisconsin has a huge budget surplus. We did record investments in uh, public schools. We have taken care of the needs of health care. We have done things in a way that everybody around the country should look at Wisconsin and say, that's the kind of place that we want to emulate. Uh, we know that in D.C., we have now seen record spending, debts, deficit, uh, massive giveaways all at a time when most employers can't find enough people to work because of the largesse that's gone out from the federal treasury to really pay people in many ways not to work. Uh, that is really unfortunate. We need to kind of return to that Wisconsin work ethic, which is, I think, what Republicans in our state have always stood for. We want to help reward hard work all the way back to Tommy Thompson. Uh, making sure that we show people that working is the best way out of poverty. It was continued by Governor Walker, and hopefully whoever the next governor is, God willing, a Republican, will be able to showcase that again and not have this situation like we do in Wisconsin, where far too many people are suffering because of the ineptitude of the Evers administration. We've exceeded our time. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, thank you for your time. We appreciate it like always. Thanks, Matt.